Welcome. Okay, to start with, I have a little quiz for you. This is a small farm strip around 50 miles to the west of London in the UK. I'm established on short final, but which side is the strip on? Is it this nice green one on the left here? Or is it the one on the right here? I'll let you know a bit later on, but for now, let's get on with the video. Hi, my name's Terry, and I'm just on my way to visit the little farm strip of Bennington. It's set on open farmland, has a single rough grass runway orientated 0624 at only 400 metres or 1,312 feet long. There's nothing there apart from a couple of hangars and a bench to eat a picnic on, but I absolutely love visiting these places by air. I'm often asked if farm and short strip flying is dangerous, and I have to give an honest and straight answer, which is, well, it's complicated. Flying a single engine aircraft as a private pilot carries some risks, even if all you ever do is fly from one big airport to another. But it's not the same as driving your car, nor is it anywhere near as safe as commercial flying. So why make it even riskier by flying your private aircraft into short, poorly prepared grass and farm strips? It's certainly not for everyone, and that's understandable. But for those that enjoy a different kind of challenge, it can't be beaten. So the simple answer to the question, are short grass and farm strips dangerous is, I suppose yes they are, but there's a lot you can do to mitigate the risks and in this video I want to go through them and offer some of the techniques I've adopted to reduce the risks to a point where they're as minimal as possible. In the UK we have a large network of small grass and farm strips in some of the most beautiful parts of the country where access by car can sometimes be difficult. So to have the chance to fly into these private places makes you feel very privileged indeed. There's also the added benefit that often these strips can be located close to friends or relatives where bigger airports or airfields may not be, making visiting much more convenient. Flying into strips is also an excellent way to practice your aircraft handling skills as they often require unusual approach, pattern or joining techniques as well as accurate speed control and flying to avoid obstacles and threats on and around the strip. So how does a farm or grass strip differ from an airfield anyway? Well for starters airfields may have grass or hard runways but they are also designated places for aircraft to operate to and from. They'll usually have standard marked runways, which will normally be orientated into the prevailing wind. They will have relatively clear areas for aircraft to approach and depart safely, a radio service, and if you're really lucky, a CAF. Farm and grass strips, on the other hand, will normally have none of these things. They are not licensed and may have hazardous features that you would not find at a regular aerodrome. They are, to all intents and purposes, just a field that the owner lets aircraft operate to and from. So if you want to go try stripping, you need to remember that these fields are private and are on private property. So it's imperative that you make sure you obtain permission before visiting. This will also give you the opportunity to get a full brief and ask any questions that you may have. Sometimes the answer may be no to visiting, as the field may be for the owner's use only, or there may be farming activities which will take precedence. Or the strip may be unsuitable due to flooding, or maybe even the grass hasn't been cut. Like most things in life, to do a job right, you need the correct tool. And when flying into these places, having an aircraft capable of dealing with short grass rough runways is imperative. Now the Sport Cruiser is not an aircraft that immediately comes to mind for strip flying, but it is light, it has great performance and a low stall speed. However, it is not as robust as the dedicated backcountry and rough strip aircraft and needs to be treated with respect. It has tiny wheels and tires, low wings and a nose gear that won't tolerate any abuse. So choosing the right kind of strip is important if you want to use the aircraft to get out again afterwards. I won't use it on soft strips or after heavy rain. I also avoid rutted or really rough ground, but apart from that, I'll take it into most fields. Being current on short strips is also imperative. If you haven't landed on grass, learn that first on a nice big runway. And if you're not able to land and stop within the POH's figures, then practice until you can nail it every single time. But do this with an instructor, again on a forgiving runway. I also like to take any opportunity I can to practice short field landings on safer runways. Like this one a couple of years ago at Sandown. They were installing a new all-weather surface, but only laid 200 metres or 650 feet of it. 
They gave me the opportunity to use it and I treated it as if I only had the 200 meters to land on, even though if I'd overrun, I would have just transitioned to the main grass runway. I was actually amazed that even though the aircraft was quite heavy, it managed to stop in the available length. Doing your pre-planning correctly is probably the most important thing you can do to reduce the risks as much as possible. It's a legal requirement and something that is ideally done before you get to the airfield to go flying. In the UK, the CAA issues a great safety sense leaflet with regard to strip flying and I suggest you take a good look at it. I'll link it in the description below. They go over all the important stuff but needless to say your actual aircraft performance and not just the POH figures, your technique, your experience and the actual conditions on the day will have a dramatic effect on whether a strip is possible to visit safely or not. So ensure you add on plenty of margin for all this. First problem you normally come across is finding the strip amongst the rest of the landscape. With little or no markings it's normally just a changing colour or shade that denotes the runway and as the field colours change throughout the seasons it will never normally look the same from one month to the next. This is where GPS is a godsend, but as some of these strips won't be in your chosen flight app, there will be little or no runway info in the database, which makes it imperative to have pre-planned properly. I normally do this on Google Maps, where I can use the measure tool to check lengths and distances to obstructions. Sometimes I even print it off and take it with me. I'll then enter the waypoints into the flight app and mark any approach obstacles or any special requirements as waypoints as well. If there's no specific radio frequency, I'll use the UK safety comp frequency of 135.480 and make blind calls from around 10 miles or 10 minutes out. Then standard calls all the way down to the ground. I'll be listening out for other traffic, calling the same strip all of the time. I find unless there's any special instructions, I like to do a standard overhead join once I get to the strip. This gives you a good look and if they have a windsock, I'll check that or if not, I'll use a local airfield's reported wind direction and decide which runway I'm going to use. If I'm visiting a strip for the first time, I'll only visit in light winds and good weather, and if there's an easier runway direction, I'll hold off until the wind is in a direction that favours that runway. Once I'm established in the pattern, I'll have a good look around at the hazards, obstacles and the runway condition, and I'll plan out my final approach. You've got to remember that these strips are not primarily a runway, and it's not unusual yeah, to find yeah. farm machinery or people close to the strip. Especially because there's absolutely nothing in front of it. Oh, there's a bloody combine. Yeah, apart from that. <laughs> Is he moving out of the way? Yeah, yeah, he's going left. Okay, so back to the aircraft, and I'm just turning final onto Bennington's runway 24. There's some trees to fly over, but the strip has clear approaches. There's also a small wooded area to the west side of the strip. When there's a westerly wind, this can cause a lot of turbulence. But today the wind is light, and apart from some thermals, the air is pretty smooth. Once established on final, you've got a last opportunity to assess the surface and ensure the runway is clear and safe to land on. Some strips can be really difficult to see what's runway and what's rough field. So let's go back to that quiz question I asked you at the beginning of the video. Did you say left or right? Well, if you say left, I couldn't blame you. It's a lovely looking freshly mowed green grass strip. However, it's not the runway. The landing strip is actually on the right. This is Furs Farm, where a few years ago a pilot made the mistake of landing on the wrong part of this, and this is what happened. There's been many accidents caused by misidentifying the runway and landing on unsuitable ground, so if you're not confident you've got the right area to land on, then just go around. My aim is to try and land as near to the start of the strip as possible, which is why it is so important to ensure there's no wires, fences or obstructions that you may not see until it's too late. I'm a little too fast on this approach, and because of that I float a bit further down the strip than I would have liked, but I still managed to touch down with plenty of runway left. I park clear of the runway and go and fill in the movements book. Once at the strip, if they have a movements book you must fill it in and pay any landing fee, although often the farmers don't charge. You need to remember that you're at an uncontrolled airstrip so aircraft can arrive and depart at any time. So don't block hangars or buildings when you park up. And if it is a farm strip, you may encounter large farm machinery that you need to keep well out of the way of. 
If I can, I like to take the opportunity of walking the strip just to make a note of any areas to steer clear of on the takeoff run and in case I visit in future. Bennington traffic, Golf Charlie Zulu Falkers are taxiing runway 23 Bennington. When departing, make sure you call your intentions on the radio, which will alert any aircraft intending on landing that you're about to backtrack or line up. If I have to backtrack, like I am here at Bennington, I try to taxi slowly along the same line that I intend on departing on. That way, if there are any unseen ruts or holes, I'll only be running over them slowly and can avoid them on the takeoff run. All looks clear, really good look around. So I'm going to hold it on the brakes. I use a short field technique for pretty much all grass strip flying even if the ground is dry and the grass is short. I rotate the aircraft early and take the weight off by entering ground effect using that cushion of air between the wing and the strip to reduce friction and allow acceleration. I can then build up speed and climb quickly carrying lots of energy. You should use the technique talk to you or that's in your POH. Farm and short grass strips do have extra challenges and dangers that you need to be careful of but if you treat them with respect they can give you some of the most rewarding flying you'll ever get. In my opinion, strip flying, like most things, is as dangerous as you want to make it. But by pre-planning properly, being comfortable with your aircraft, current on short fields and grass, and respectful of the hazards, and by always being ready to throw it away and come back on another day, it can be no more dangerous than any other flying you'd do in a single engine piston aircraft. However, if you want to see how things can go very wrong very quickly on a short strip, then watch this video next. I'm not an instructor and this video is for entertainment only. Thank you so much for watching and short field out.